So we've, we've just dealt with representation of big arrays of numbers, but now we need to have some way of presenting them visually on the screen. And like everything else in Python, there are lots of different ways of, of handling that problem. We'll just talk about a couple of them today, a couple of the more popular ones. All right, this is often a point of confusion. I covered this a little bit a couple of uh, classes ago when we were talking about IPY and B files. Uh, for people who are beginners at programming, it's critical to understand that the extension on a file name, so if you have abc.txt or abc.doc, that extension is usually a good indication of what the file contains, but it doesn't prescribe what's actually in the file. If you rename a .txt file as a .doc file, that does not magically change the contents of the file, so it is that other file type. Um, I, I realize that sounds obvious to a lot of you, but there, there are people who are confused by this, this concept. Uh, and these different file types are extremely different from one another. So if you open Word, create a Word document, and you type a piece of a, a chunk of Python code into it, and you save it as a doc file or a docx file, Python will not be able to read that file and do anything with it. A doc file contains formatting information, and it contains page layout information, all sorts of other stuff. Python wants to see just a straight text file, which just contains the basic code. Now, you will find that most commercial software has tools for dealing with different file types. You know, if you're running Word, you can export the file in other file formats, like a text file. Um, but that's, that's good, you know, those capabilities are going to depend on what this, the, the specific software package is. Uh, now that you're, you're dealing with programming, you have to be very aware of this fact because uh, to be able to successfully read the information stored in a file, you have to know how that information is arranged. If it's a text file, it's straightforward. If it's a binary file which contains raw numerical values, then you have to know how those raw numerical values are arranged in the file to be able to read them in and do anything with them. Okay. Having said that, reading and writing files in Python is fairly straightforward. And for those of you who know some other programming language, uh, it's very similar between, between, you know, Python's mechanism for doing this is very similar to other languages' mechanisms for doing this. Uh, fundamentally, when you have a file on disk, that file contains numbers. You may not always see the numbers. If you, if you, if you open the file into the program, you'll see, how, you'll see the program's interpretation of the numbers. But fundamentally, a file on disk is just like a chunk of memory on the computer. It's just a whole bunch of numbers organized in some fashion in the file. Uh, so there are various ways of reading and writing those numbers. Before you can access the information in a file, you have to open the file. So let's... I'm going to go ahead and create a simple text <coughs> file. All right, I don't really care what it contains, so I'm just going to take this text from my screen. Don't worry about the details of what I'm doing here. Okay. So I now have a file in my local folder on my, on my computer's hard drive called x.txt. That file contains that text that you just saw me, oops. That file contains that text that you just saw me copy and paste from my terminal window, okay? Nothing very exciting. So let's say we want to read that text file into the computer and do something with it. So I'm going to say uh, t is equal to, uh, well, we'll, do this. we'll say f is equal to uh, f so open x.txt comma r. f is now a text IO wrapper, name x equals txt, mode equals r, and code equals utf8. When I open a file, what it returns to me is a handle, a file handle object. And that file handle object allows you to manipulate the file. 
It lets you read from the file, it lets you write to the file, uh, it lets you move to different places in the file, um, it basically lets you do all the sorts of things that you might need to do with, with the file uh, on the disk. So if I want to just read everything in the file into a variable, I can say x, er, sorry, a is equal to f.read. And now a is the contents of the file. Now you'll notice that it has this, the backslash n stuff in the middle. Uh, if I say print a instead, it'll be more readable. All right, so that's the content, the entire contents of the file in the string. Uh, I can say len a, and you can see I read 1813 characters. Uh, now that's fine, that's, that's actually a really easy strategy. So if you have a small file on the disk and you want to do something with it in Python, you could just read the entire thing in, into Python and then you can use string processing methods to manipulate it in some way, something like that. That, that works very well for a lot of things. Uh, however, uh, let's say you have a text file which contains uh, you know, 10 billion values in it. Uh, you know, 10 billion measurements that you made over some period of time. Uh, if you read that entire file into memory, uh, you may exhaust the memory on your computer. Uh, it will take a really long time. You know, what if you only need to use the first few thousand of them? Then reading the entire file and, and then just accessing a, a piece of it is not a very efficient way of, of handling it. Uh, so uh, there, there are good reasons for not wanting to do what we just did. So there are other ways we can we can access the file. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. So I've, so I still have my open file pointer, but if I try to read from it now, if I say a dot oh, sorry f dot read, uh, I get nothing, and that's because I already read the entire file, and now the file now we're at the end of the file. So if we want to read the file again, we have to go back to the beginning of the file. So there's a method called seek. And C says, I want to go to position X in, in the file. Uh, so now I can say f.read again, and I'll get the entire file back out again. All right, so let's, let's go back to the beginning. And now, instead of reading the entire file, I can do something like this. Let's say f.read 10. That'll read the first 10 bytes of the file. If I do it again, it'll read the next 10 bytes. Each time I do it, it'll read the next 10 bytes in the file. So I can tell it the, the maximum number I want to read. If I get to the end of the file and there's only five bytes left and I say read 10, it'll only read five. Uh, but if there are 10 available, it'll read them. So it reads 10 and then it moves to the end of the 10. And then it reads 10 and then it moves to the end of the 10 and, and so on. Uh, now that's, that's fine, but if it's a text file, uh, I may have different lines in my text file, right? And some of the lines are long lines and some of the lines are short lines. Uh, so what if I want to read the text file one line at a time? How would I do that? If I want to use this read mechanism, I would have to say read more than the, you know, at least as much as the longest possible line in the file. And then I would have to figure out where the end of the line was. And then I have to keep the leftover bit uh, and then I'd have to add that to the beginning of the next time. It would just be a real mess to do. So there's convenience mechanisms built in to deal with text files specifically. Uh, so let's rewind again. So let me go back to, to zero. And now I'm going to say, instead of read, I'm going to say read line. And that will give me the first line in the file. And if I do it again, the second line in the file third line in the file, etc. And you'll note that it keeps the backslash n, the, the new line at the end of the file. Uh, you can also use files as iterators in for loops. So you can pretend that the file is a Python list, basically. So I can say for line in f print line. Okay, so that loop, each time we, we go through the loop one cycle, it's going to read one line from the file. Now, you'll notice if you look really carefully that this looks a little different than it did up here when I read the entire file and printed it out. And now here, you can see there's blank lines between every other line. The reason that's happening uh, is because when I read the line, 
I just mentioned that, that it preserved the backslash n at the end of the line. So that it preserved the new line at the end. So when I say print line, it prints the line, it prints the new line at the end and goes to the next line. And then the print statement defaults to also putting a new line to finishing the line at the end. So if I want to avoid that, I would have to say end equals nothing. If you remember that as a way of sort of avoiding print, putting a new line at the end of the line. So now if I do this, it'll work. All right. Uh, so reading from files, um, when I open the file here, I open the file for uh, in, in mode R. That says I want to read from the file. If I try and write something to the file, it will give me an error because I've only opened the file for reading. There are other modes. So there's read mode, that's the default. There's write mode. Uh, the trick with write mode though is if I, if I open a file for writing and the file already exists, it erases the file and moves to the beginning. So this is a really serious gotcha. If you open an existing file for writing accidentally with W, you delete the file immediately. No errors, no, no question. Do you sure you want to do this? No, nope, it just deletes the file. You can cause havoc in your file system accidentally doing that. Um, if you say A, that opens the file for writing. But if the file already exists, it moves to the end of the file and opens it for writing at the end of the file. So it won't delete the file first, but you won't have any way of doing anything at the earlier part of the file. You'll only be able to add to the end of the file. So the typical mode that people use when they want to open a file for both reading and writing is R plus. So plus allows you to add writing capability to any other mode. So W plus is just pointless. But R plus is useful. So if I if I open this file for okay, so I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna reopen the file. But I'm gonna say R plus. Oops. R plus. Uh, and again F is the file now, but you can see now it's mode R plus. Um, and again if I say a is equal to f dot read and print a. I have exactly what I had before. Let's try that. And I'll explicitly close it. Okay, so now you can see I overwrote the beginning of the file with more text. So you can go to any point in the file that you want, that you like, and you can insert or you can overwrite contents of the file in specific locations using the seek capability. All right, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip ahead past a lot of this stuff. There's all sorts of interesting things you can do with files: uh, read, read line, read lines, uh, write, close. We've talked about all that stuff. Flush allows you to, you know, so if you write something to a file, sometimes it won't go to the file immediately. It'll wait until it has enough information to write, the f write it to the file at one, all at one time because it's more efficient. Uh, flush will tell the, the system, I've still got this file open, but I want to make sure that the stuff that I wrote to the file is actually on the disk right now. Uh, so it allows you to, to handle that. Uh, we'll see later in the class a couple of cases where this is actually a useful thing to do. Uh, tell is the opposite of seek. Seek will go to a particular place in the file. Tell will tell you where you are. So it returns a number. And that's about it for file manipulation. We already talked about this actually in, a, in the last lecture when we were talking about modules. Uh, so there are various methods you can use to uh, rename files and, and get information about files and that sort of thing available. Now we really need to get into the plotting. Uh, we really just have a couple of quick examples here of, of how to use the two plotting modules. So the two that I'm going to talk about today are matplotlib and bokeh. Uh, so matplotlib is, is closely related to scipy. Uh, bokeh is, uh, matplotlib allows you to make sort of publication quality PDF files and stuff like that. It's very useful. Bokeh is designed more for interactive plotting within, say, a Jupyter environment. So we'll start with matplotlib. 
and we'll use this simple example. All right, here we go. Um, now, what did I do here? So I say x equals a range going from 0 to 4 pi, stepping by 0 0.05. So x is now an array with all of the x values. Uh, and then I can make my y values just with this simple function, y equals sine of x. And then I use plot x, y. So this is using a particular interface to matplotlib called pylab. Uh, you can tell sort of based on the name, this was based on the, based on, on math, uh, sorry, on, uh, on MATLAB. So the plotting capabilities in MATLAB used a particular interface, and they were, the guy who wrote this was sort of trying to mimic those interfaces. So if you import uh, pylab, you will get this sort of immediate capability, interactive capability of being able to use, just say plot, and it'll plot stuff on the screen. Now what you get here, this object is just a fixed image. You can't interact with it in any way interactively. Uh, but there are options that you can use with matplotlib to uh, save it to PDF files and do things like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can just do this example yourself if you're interested in seeing it. You can, you know, matplotlib is an extremely uh, feature-rich library. Uh, if you go to this tutorial that I link here. Oh. All right, apparently I didn't... Uh, set up my Wi-Fi connection. Anyway, if you go to this tutorial here, there's a great, uh, a great, great set of documentation for matplotlib. Um, it also includes some 3D capabilities. Uh, oops. Go. Uh, so you can make 3D plots. Again, this isn't inter interactive, it's just, uh, it's just a single snapshot, but there are options you can use to specify orientation and that sort of thing. Now, the reason I have this, or from the command line, if you use Python from the command line instead of in JupyterLab, uh, and you do your plotting there, you can get interactive plots with matplotlib, where you can interactively rotate and zoom and, and do that sort of thing. Uh, and that will actually become relevant maybe a little later in the class. All right, so let's just quickly finish up with Boca. So Boca is a completely independent library. Uh, but you can see now I actually have a set of widgets, oops, sorry, widgets on the side, so I can actually interactively do stuff instead of, oops, I can interactively zoom in and out and save things to disk and, and all sorts of things uh, once I create these Boca widgets. But what I did here was basically exactly the same things I did up there. You have to say, specify this output notebook to say that you want to render inside this Jupyter Lab session. Uh, there's, a, there's a few more things that you have to do to create the plot, but it's not really much more complicated than, uh, than what we were doing up above with, with matplotlib. I think I have maybe one more example from Boca here. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just a slight variation on the, the previous example. Um, let's see if I've got a web connection now. Just wanted to... Yeah, all right. So here's the tutorial in matplotlib. I wanted to also point you at this. If you can't read that, it says gallery. Uh, gallery has a page full of example plots that were all done using matplotlib. And this is a really great resource because if you click on any of these examples, uh, it will show you not only the example, but, oh, sorry, I didn't pick a very good one. Anyway, if you go down, it'll show you the code that was used to produce that exact plot. So you can get examples for exactly what commands you might need to use to generate any sort of, uh, any sort of plot that you like. Okay, that's it for plotting. Uh, there, are, there are lots and lots of capabilities here. You really just have to sort of play with it and get used to it to, to find out what all the capabilities are. These aren't the only two choices. There are other plotting libraries available for, for Python as well. Uh, there are some commercial ones. There are some other free ones. I would say these are probably the two most popular for those particular uses.